Now, I've been asked to speak on the theme <clears throat> of Roman history, uh, particularly the problem of inflation and its impact. My analysis is based on the premise that monetary policy cannot be studied or understood in isolation from the overall policies of a state. Monetary, fiscal, military, political, economic issues are all very much intertwined. And the reason they are all so intertwined is in part due to the fact that the state, any state, normally seeks to monopolize the supply of money within its own territory. Monetary policy, therefore, always serves, even if it serves badly, the perceived needs of the rulers of the state. If it also happens to enhance the prosperity and progress of the masses of the people, that is a secondary benefit. But its first aim is to serve the needs of the rulers, not the ruled. And this point is central, I believe, to an understanding of the course of monetary policy in the late Roman Empire. Historians of prices in the Roman Empire have come to the conclusion that despite all of this inflation, the price of gold, in terms of its purchasing power, remained stable from the first through the fourth century. In other words, gold remained, in terms of its purchasing power, uh, a stable value, whereas all this coinage just became uh, increasingly worthless. Now, what were the causes of this inflation? The size of the army, I think I indicated already, had increased, uh, doubled from the time of Augustus to Diocletian, and the size of the civil service I indicated also. Now, all these events strained the fiscal resources of the state beyond its ability to sustain itself. And uh, the debasement uh, and the taxation were both used to keep the ship of state going, uh, frequently by debasing, then by uh, taxation, and then often simply by accusing people of treason and confiscating their estates. One of the odd things about inflation is, in the Roman Empire, that while uh, the Roman state survived, the Roman state was not destroyed by inflation. What was destroyed by inflation was the freedom of the Roman people. And particularly, the first victim was their economic freedom. Rome had basically a uh, laissez-faire concept uh, of uh, state uh, economy relations. Except in emergencies, which were usually related to war, uh, the Roman government generally followed a policy of uh, free trade and uh, minimal restriction on the economic activities of its population. But now, under the pressure of this uh, need to pay the troops and under the pressure of inflation, the liberty of the people began to be seriously eroded, and very rapidly. Uh, we could start with the class known as the decuriones, the decurions. This was your prosperous, small, and middle landowning class who were the dominant elements of the cities of the Roman Empire. This class, in the mid-third century, was assigned a task of collecting the taxes in the municipality that were being assessed by the central government. The central government could no longer collect its taxes effectively, so they made the decurion class collectively responsible for getting revenues and passing them on to the imperial government. Uh, the decurions, of course, had as much difficulty as anyone else in doing this, and uh, the returns were, again, frequently inadequate, so the government solved that problem by simply passing a law that any taxes the decurions could not collect from others, they would have to pay out of their own pocket. That's known as the incentive method for the tax collector. <laughs> Uh, as you can well imagine, as the crisis became greater 
and the economy was disrupted by civil conflicts and invasions and the effects of uh, inflation, uh, the Decurians, uh, strangely enough, no longer wanted to be Decurians. And uh, they began to abandon their lands, abandon their cities, and escape to wherever they could find refuge in other larger cities or other provinces. Uh, but they were not to be allowed to do that with impunity, and the law was then passed that any Decurian discovered somewhere else was to be uh, arrested, uh, bound like a slave, and carted back to his hometown where he was restored to his dignity as a Decurian. <laughs> The peasantry, uh, known as the uh, uh, coloni, uh, these were leaseholders on uh, both imperial and private estates. They too, formerly a free class, were now uh, under the same kinds of pressures that all smallholders were in this uh, situation. And they began to drift away trying to find better opportunities, better lease leases, better occupations. And so, uh, under Diocletian, the coloni were now bound to the soil. Anyone who had a lease on a particular piece of land could not give that lease up. More than that, they had to stay on the land and work it. In effect, this is the beginning of what in the Middle Ages is called serfdom. But it, it actually has its origins here in the late Roman society. In fact, as you read through the rest of the thing, it becomes clear that the reason there, the uh, edict on prices was issued, prices and wages was issued, <clears throat> was that the soldiers were the principal victims of the inflation and that Diocletian was afraid he was losing control of his army. And so uh, the people who are uh, to be protected are the soldiers and the other servants of the state. Constantine's reforms were also partial, but of sufficient vigor and radical character to make a difference. Through his willingness to extract by compulsion the gold reserves of the taxpayers, forcing them to disgorge their bullion, he placed an ever-increasing supply of gold in the hands of the government officials. This was increasingly used to pay military bonuses, salaries for bureaucrats, and even payments for certain public works. Increasingly then, a two-tier monetary system emerged in which the government, the soldiers, and the bureaucrats enjoyed the benefits of a gold standard, while the non-governmental portion of the economy continued to struggle with a rapidly uh, inflating fiat currency. Thus, the state had found a way to protect itself and its servants from the unwholesome effects of its own earlier inflationary uh, cycle. Meanwhile, the masses suffered from massive injection of fiat money, which they had to accept in payment for government requisitions of such gold or silver or other commodities which the government demanded. Now, we may wish to find some lessons in this tale of... Uh, monetary policies of the late Roman Empire. The first lesson, I think, must be that if war uh, is the health of the state, as Rand Randolph Bourne said, uh, it is poison to a stable and sound money. The Roman monetary crisis, therefore, was uh, closely connected with the Roman uh, military problem. Another lesson is that the problems become solvable when a ruler decides that something can be done and must be done. Diocletian and Constantine clearly were willing to act to protect their own ruling class interests, the military and the civil service. Monetary reforms uh, were necessary to win the support of the troops and the bureaucrats that composed the only real constituency of the Roman state and the two-tier system was designed to this end. It, bought, it brought about a stable monetary standard for the ruling group and did not hesitate to secure it, who did not hesitate to secure it 
at the expense of the mass of the population. <clears throat> now, the Roman state <clears throat> survived. The liberty of the Roman people did not. When freedom became possible in the West in the 5th century with the barbarian invasions, people took advantage of the possibility of change. The Roman people, the mass of the population, had but one wish after being captured by the barbarians, that they would never again fall under the rule of the Roman bureaucracy. In other words, the Roman state was the enemy. The barbarians were the liberators. <clears throat> 